It's June 21st, 1900, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Righteous and Harmonious Fists would possibly have made a good title for a sequel to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but it was also the name of a secretive organisation of Chinese martial arts experts that led an uprising in northern China against the late 19th century spread of Western and Japanese influence there, an insurrection that became known as the Boxer Rebellion, which came to a head today in history in 1900, when China formally declared war on all foreign invading powers. They originated in Shandong, a province on the east coast of China, which had been a centre of thought and ideological movements throughout Chinese history. It was the birthplace of Confucius, partly because it was a land and sea trading hub. And this was part of the issue. You know, just prior to the rebellion, two of the region's major ports had been leased to Britain and Germany, respectively. And there'd also been a huge influx of Christian missionaries. They were seen as interfering with Chinese traditions, misusing their influence. And there were several of these paramilitary style secret martial arts groups that had started up. And the boxers had begun actually before all of this in the 1880s and it was a spiritual movement focused on martial arts, traditional values and a little bit of magic. They believed that their calisthenic rituals and martial arts would render them impervious to all harm and Westerners actually dubbed the rituals of their calisthenic practice as shadow boxing and that's how we got to the nickname of the boxers but some of the members attempted to perfect this mystical skill that was called iron shirt and this Involved toughening and tensing the body to withstand blows. You've kind of seen it being done by kung fu experts uh, today. But the idea that they had was that it would render them even impervious to bullets. And the boxer groups also believed that when they attacked, millions of soldiers would descend from heaven to assist them in, like, purifying China, they believed, of this foreign oppression that had become such a shame for them. So what had happened was, uh, toward the end of the previous century... Japan defeated China in the Sino-Japan War. And as a result of that, all of these uh, foreign countries, Austria, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Russia and Japan, all had exclusive trading rights over specific areas of China. And along with that, Europeans were free to go there and proselytise and convert people. And these guys were in the north. And in the north, there was a tension specifically around... Chinese Christians, not only because they felt the cultural threat, but actually they they really believed that the gods weren't being prayed to correctly. And so entire communities that would traditionally come together and pray during times of drought for rain were not getting Mm. rain on their crops. A lot of ordinary Chinese peasants thought that their medicines wouldn't work if Christians weren't praying for the right thing, that the rain wouldn't fall, that the crops wouldn't come and that the Europeans were were sabotaging their nation, Mm. essentially. Yeah, the upshot was that they ended up technically supporting the emperor, you know, the emperor being seen as the you know, the seat of Chinese culture and power. But the, the Qing dynasty were really trying to keep them at arm's length. You know, they were afraid of having hundreds of thousands of marauding peasants who were supposedly helping them. I mean, the boxer slogan it might lose something in translation, but it's definitely to the point, support the Qing government and exterminate the foreigners. Yeah, and so the boxer movement was expanding and eventually getting closer and closer to the Beijing region in 1900. They were kind of killing foreigners as they go and particularly targeting Chinese Christians and Christian missionaries and the destruction of churches. But then it moved to like railroad stations and other infrastructure. And it was kind of that that made the the Qing dynasty go, "This this is a problem for us. It's obviously a problem for foreigners, but it's also an internal problem. And that was why, in a sense, the tension between the imperial court and their sort of split allegiance between their own people and not wanting to piss off the foreigners too much, who, after all, have a great foothold in the country, was very hard to navigate. Once you start getting towards Peking, as it was then, modern day Beijing, you know, you are, you know, shit gets serious, doesn't it? Like, it's one thing to go around kind of marauding and and really believe you can tell they believed god was on their side because of this hubris right marauding and killing the old german and saying you shouldn't be here that's one thing but once you start descending on the yeah. capital <laughs> where the empress dowager is but also all of the diplomatic quarter like everybody all of those international relations you are effectively declaring war on all of those nations and that's what brings us to today in history when the empress dowager xi formally declared war on 
the US, Britain, Germany, France, and Japan. Um, it was a pretty bold, it was a pretty, pretty bold move. She was technically the co-ruler. You know, China had an emperor, the Guangzhou emperor, but he had tried to embrace these Western-style reforms. He'd seen what was happening in Japan with the Meiji Restoration that we've talked about before and how that country was, you know, modernising along Western lines. But China hadn't really done it very well. He had really only focused on modernising the military and all of these reforms proved really unpopular. So his aunt, the Empress Dowager Shiji, had basically manoeuvred a coup and he was under house arrest, although still technically the emperor. So this put all of the power into the hands of the Empress Dowager and her conservative allies who were taking this anti-Western stance, which, you know, they were really putting on the main stage at this point by declaring war against basically all of the major Western powers. And one of the British officers involved was Lieutenant Colonel Francis Poole of the East Yorkshire Regiment, who was in command of this really hastily raised international volunteers group within the legation district, trying to defend themselves from the, you know, incoming boxes. And he said of the various troops involved in the defence that the British were naturally the smartest and the Americans were a serviceable looking lot, but he was slightly less complimentary about the Russians and the Italians, as you would Mm. absolutely absolutely expect of, like, this person in this position. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, it may be that the records we have, obviously, are the English language ones, but it does appear that the British Army did behave better, it must be said, than the Germans and the Russians in particular. There were atrocities like rape and murder that they went about committing as, as they went towards the capital. Kaiser Wilhelm II sent over the Germans with the following command... Bear yourselves as Huns of Attila for a thousand years. Let the Chinese tremble at the approach of a German. A lot of the troops were colonial troops. They were British Indians, Mm. troops from Australia, from the French colonies. So it was a really interesting mix. You know, it was colonial powers sending colonial troops to try and impose a more colonial style of rule in China. The Europeans who were under siege in Beijing, they were a very small number. It was 473 civilians and 409 soldiers. You know, all they had to defend themselves really was small arms. And they had this vintage muzzle-loading cannon that was nicknamed the International Gun because the barrel was British, the gun carriage was Italian, the shells were Russian and the crew was American. So you think <laughs> with all of these you know, tens of thousands of imperial Chinese troops and boxers swarming around outside, the tale that was kind of told was that the Europeans and Americans had been able to fend them off and been able to protect themselves. But really, you know, you're talking about less than a thousand people. Mm. They would easily have been overrun. What was actually happening was that the Empress's chief counsellor, Ronglu, he had opposed this imperial degree. He thought it was crazy to try to fight eight powerful nations all at once, even if it was more of a statement than anything else. And he was out there really trying to keep this siege a stalemate because, you know, between the imperial forces, you also had individual warlords from different regions of China who were in command of their own forces and all of these boxers who didn't really have a clear leader, he was really on the outside trying to keep the siege at a stalemate because he could see how disastrous it would be to overrun the legation quarter and murder all of the Europeans. Yeah, I mean, it didn't take long after the international force arrived in Peking for them to just quickly liberate the legation quarter. And you could imagine that at this point, like members of the court might be holding that that would be as far as the international allies would go. But of course, that wasn't as far as they went. And they immediately marched towards the gates of the Forbidden City, which was, you know, the home of the Chinese power for almost 2000 years. But the Empress Dowager had fled at this stage disguised as a peasant. Most of the royal court had gone as well. And, you know, the international forces basically then divided Beijing into districts, uh, with each nation administering one of the areas. And in some of these districts, those suspected of being boxers were then just subjected to summary executions, and you had more general hideousness going on. And in the British district, Lieutenant General Sir Alfred Gasly, who was the guy who led the international force, he established auctions of loot uh, at the British legation, with the proceeds being distributed by a prize committee to the troops. Yeah, the International Coalition is credited with the theft from the Forbidden City of 3,000 gold-plated Buddhas. Imagine trying to shift all of them down the pub. Tomorrow. Screaming, answer the question, jerk. He then hit a ball into the crowd and smashed a tray of water bottles with his racket. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.